Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Fiji. And as you can see, Fiji is an island archipelago here in the South Pacific Ocean. So, normally I would flip to the big map of Oceania in my atlas, but considering how chaotic that would be for the film setup. I'm going to show you the map that's in this book. We'll flip through this book after I go over its history so that I can show you all the wonderful pictures of Fiji. But I'm going to show you the world map in this book. Here we go. Just so you can see where Fiji is exactly located. Let me grab a pencil. Here we have Fiji can see where it is in relation to New Zealand and Australia for more context. Fiji is part of a area of islands known as Melanesia. You can see it contains Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu is just over here on this side. Um, but this side is known as Polynesia. And just important for its history, we have Tonga over on the east side of Fiji. Just remember, that's where Tonga's located. So that's what I really wanted to show you with this map. Next, on the agenda, I'm going to zoom you in. Boom! So you can see an up-close view of these islands. So Fiji consists of 332 islands and many more islets. About one third of its islands are populated. The most populated, of course, being the largest island here of Viti Levu, where the capital city of Suva is located. Viti Levu is pretty much one giant mountain, as you can see up here, it's Mount Tomanivi, highest point, and it basically splits the island into two. We have this half of the mountain and this half of the mountain. So let's talk about this half first. This area is pretty much where, just like, like the, the regular folk live, I suppose. You'll see what I mean in a second. This is pretty much where all the farming on the island is also located. Um, it's pretty wet and rainy more on this half than on this half. This half is drier, so it's perfect for farming. You can also see a bunch of little island chains out here. I'm going to show you the most important ones for history. Not that they're like more important than others, it's just that I'm going to mention them in the history section so I want you to see them. Right here is a very teeny tiny island of Mbao. And up here is Ovalau. You can see the town of Lavuka. It's going to be important in its history. So on this half of the island is the tourist section because it's drier, not so much rain. Warmer, hotter, and absolutely beautiful. I'm sure when you picture Fiji, you picture like pristine tropical beaches and all that. That is pretty much where this is right here. You can see Nandi Bay. This is the international airport, nowhere near the capital city or any of these other areas. It's all over here. This is all the touristy section. There's a group of islands out here known as the Mamanua Islands. Mamanua. Yeah. Mamanua. Anyway, it's not it's not written on here, so I can, I'm not positive this stuff of memory. But these are the like fancy, fancy tourist islands. That's where all the private islands are, and that's where you're shelling out the big bucks for your tropical experience. You can also see all the coral over here. That's where all the coral reef diving happens for the tourists. So when you visit Fiji on your luxury tropical vacation, you're going to land here in Nandi. And pretty much if you want to explore the rest, you'd really have to like go out of your way to do so because this is the area for the beautiful touristy beaches, which I'm not knocking them. They're absolutely spectacular. Let's check out Vanua Levu, the second largest island. This is a volcanic island. The rest aren't. They're just like rocky, corally islands. So makes this a bit different. And Vanua Levu is where 
the majority of the sugar cane industry is in Fiji. We'll talk about that and its history as well. But for the most part, it is not nearly as populated as Viti Levu. 70% of the population of Fiji lives on Viti Levu, and I think Vanu Levu is like 17% of the population. And everyone else is spread out. So it's very like tropical, forest, rugged kind of terrain. And of course, like mountainy, what have you. And we can see the large island of Taveuni. This is also a volcanic island. Um, kind of another like touristy, not touristy, but um, like eco-touristy, I should say. Not like your luxury, like cabana or cabin on the sea or anything. That's where you're like hiking through the jungle and stuff. So there's a couple of other island chains we're going to talk about just real quick. This is known as the Yasawa chain. Lots of little corally atolls, what have you. Over here we have the Lao group, which the island we're going to talk about in its history, sorry, is La Keba. You can see right here. That's going to come up in history. But as you can see, there's so many different islands and even more that aren't on this map because they're more north or south, but still part of Fiji. There's a lot of geography, but it's a really interesting place. Let's talk about its history, because uh, Fiji in history is something else, because I've covered a couple of Melanesian and Polynesian countries on my channel, and uh, this one definitely has the most extensive history, besides Nauru, I suppose. Nauru has n no country's history stranger than Nauru, so there's no comparison, but lots happened on Fiji. The first people believed to have settled here would have been the Lapita culture, which were like, I think like Moana style travelers across the sea, uh, left behind pottery, things like that. They settled here any time between 3500 and 1000 BCE. Later the Melanesians would have come and intermingled with the people who were already here, creating the Fijians. And by the 10th century, this area was under the influence of Tonga, which was a very dominating, like, political power in this time. But they had their own thing going here. They had a lot happening. They had plantations, like banana plantations and stuff like that. They built aqueducts for the plants. They had a textile industry. They had, like, for clothes and sails and stuff, they, they built boats. They had a currency made out of sperm whale teeth, which I didn't realize were like the size of your hand. They're huge. You'll see a picture in the book. Um, they had their own system of petroglyph writing. They they had a whole society, like, you know, they, they weren't just like people in huts banging rocks together to make fire. They, it, was, it was very complex, you know? They were also incredibly warlike. They made lots of different weapons. They had, um, every island pretty much had its own version of warfare, but mainly what the islands were known for this time was cannibalism, which did happen. It wasn't like they were eating people every day. It was more of a rare ceremonial thing. If there was a, a victory, they would, you know, consume one of the enemies or something like that. It wasn't like you know, the, the, the story of cannibalism in Fiji got really sensationalized in Europe much later in its history. They became known as the Cannibal Isles, and it was like, stay away, beware, Fiji, or they'll eat you, you know. But it really wasn't like that at all. But I mean, they did. Anyway, moving on. It's definitely not practiced anymore, so don't worry about that. The first European to spot Fiji was Abel Tasman in 1643. James Cook came by in 1774. He stopped first over in Tonga, and they told him about the um, the people that lived here, because some of them were over in Tonga as well. The word for Fiji in Fijian is Viti, but in a Tongan accent, it comes out as Fiji. So they, the Tongans told Captain Cook that this was Fiji, so Captain Cook wrote it down as Fiji, and it's been that way ever since. 
William Bly, after the mutiny on the bounty, came by, and he was the first one to actually chart and map the islands in 1789. You can see um, Bly Water is the strait in between the two main islands here, named after him. And eventually, uh, European and American whalers came by to, you know, set up shops and way stations. It was also discovered there was a lot of sandalwood on the islands, which people came very valuable wood over in Southeast Asia. It's very aromatic as well. So they wiped out all of the sandalwood. It's not there anymore. They harvested all of it. They also found the Beshtemir sea cucumbers in the waters which are a delicacy in China, and they pay big bucks for it. So people came to find riches grabbing sea slugs in the water. So since there is a big influx of traders in the area, they set up their own settlement at Levuka. That was established sometime in the 1820s, and it's really interesting to see they built it like an old, tiny, like, think, like, Gold Rush Village. Like, it, it reminds me of, like, um, Frontierland in Disneyland. That's what it looks like. Along with, like, big stone churches and stuff like that. It did burn down at one point in history, so it was rebuilt to look more like that. But it, like I said, the churches were there. Christianity was brought to the islands. Some islanders converted. Some were forcefully converted. Which made some people angry. But... The Europeans and Americans hired the Fijians to work on their plantations and farms and things like that in exchange for guns. So already a very warlike civilization now has these weapons. So once we had some Fijians that were Christian, some that were not, they clashed. And one of the biggest leaders in the the anti-Christian part of Fiji was Chief Takombao, who was the chief of Bao. And he, let's see, he had an interesting history because he managed to conquer most of what is Fiji at this time. He also had an enemy over in Tonga, one of the, um, the princes there, Enele Ma'afu, was a Christian. And he had conquered Lakeba. Here, here it is. I'm at an angle, so it's making sure I'm pointing right. He had conquered Lakeba and forcefully converted everyone there to Christianity. So that was Chief Thakumbao's like sworn enemy, basically. He did not want Tonga coming over and taking over everything and converting everyone and destroying their lifestyle. So there was a lot of wars in that sense, a lot of fighting and conquering. Meanwhile, um, the, the majority of like whites in the area at this time were from Australia, like they were British from Australia. There are also many Americans um, establishing cotton plantations. And there was one consul in 1849 who after a 4th of July celebration burned down his house which was a house that was provided to him by the Fijian chiefs. So, um, and I guess as it burned, his house was looted as well. I guess free stuff before it burns, you know? So he was very upset about that. He said it was arson and demanded that the chiefs repay him for all the stuff that was burned up, which um, Takombao could not do. So he was very, very worried that the Americans would come and take over the islands, essentially say that they have the right to do so because they couldn't pay back that debt. So he had his hands tied. He wound up in 1854 forcefully converting and basically agreeing to any demands the Americans made. He was like their, their puppet king in a way. The Fijian tribes did try to come together for a little bit, from 1871 to 1874, they established the Kingdom of Fiji with Thakumbao as the king. But it collapsed pretty quickly. There were a lot of issues happening that um, were very hard to address. The um, main issue was that like, 
a system of government needed to be set because a lot of people were coming over, a lot of white people. At this time, um, the Civil War just waged over in America. So some Americans came over to build cotton plantations to try to build up a cotton industry again. And they resorted to blackbirding around the other islands in the Pacific, which is when they would head over to like the Solomon Islands or Tuvalu or anywhere and say, hey, I've got a job for you. Do you want to come over to Fiji and, um, you know, work on my plantation? It'll be great, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, sure. And they come over and they're basically kidnapped and forced to work as slaves. Really horrifying. So the Fijians were saying, stop that. Also, you should probably like pay taxes. You know, you can't just set up a huge industry like this and, you know, not give anything back. And the Americans were just like, what are you going to do about it? Like, I'm, I'm bigger and better than you, basically. I've got the Americans behind my back. If you try to threaten me, the Americans will threaten you and you'll be done. There were also a lot of people living in the interior that weren't involved in any of this so far. They were known as the Kaitolo. And they were essentially people in huts rubbing rocks together to make fire. They were very, very tribal peoples. So once their land started getting encroached on, they were fighting back, you know, raiding villages at night, waging war with the Kompau and the, the kingdom. And it, it was a lot happening. So in 1874, that Kumbau had actually gone many times to Britain and saying, do you want this land as a colony? Like, please save us from these Americans and please help us bring some order and laws and government to this area. And for the longest, Britain turned them down. But in 1874, they said yes. And Fiji became a colony of Great, uh, Great Britain. Yeah. Which at first was a big disaster. For one thing, Takombao and his sons were invited over to Australia for like a little conference. They came back with measles and the measles epidemic wiped out a third of the population, wiped out a third of the population, which was horrifying and um, a little suspicious. Um, the British, of course, deny it, but it seems strange that the British did nothing to try to curb the infections in terms of like quarantining or anything like that and you know it seemed a little suspicious that they just invited this chief over to contract measles and send it back to his people but they denied they had nothing to do with that um, they also eventually as other tribes in the interiors came out to fight against the British they also would contract the measles wiping out villages that weren't being wiped out already by the British and the Fijians fighting alongside the British. Um, there are lots of revolts over time against British rule, not just by the Kaitolo, but also by Fijians who established groups known as the Tuka, who would um, try to fight by back against the British. There were many different Tuka uprisings, but they all failed. So, the government decided that Fijians could not work on the plantations, right? It would be unethical, so they would hire indentured servants from India to come over and work the plantations. And an indentured servitude is when you come to a place, you basically work as an essentially like an unpaid worker for five years like you'll you'll get your pay eventually but you basically are worked for a certain amount of years and after that you can either just stay or you could go home so tens of thousands of indians came over to work the plantations sugar cane at this time was really popping off not to mention there is still cotton and bananas growing over here and other fruits and things like that so all of a sudden there's a huge Indian population, which um, some Fijians did not approve of. Suddenly, um, you know, was it 
By the time of independence, the Indian population was almost half of like the population of Fiji. So there was a sudden influx of this brand new, very different culture. So some people felt threatened and they discriminated against the Indians in like, um, just really bad ways to the point where when World War II happened and Britain called on the Fijians to help fight, uh, the Indian population boycotted it and refused to participate in the fighting, which the Fijians saw as very disrespectful. But eventually, they were granted their independence. Apparently, it was like, the Fijians were like, do we have to? And Britain was like, yes. <laughs> like, this is your problem now. You're independent. And they were granted their independence on October 10th, 1970, and they became part of the Commonwealth of Nations. And the racial tension between the Fijians and the Indians really came to a boiling point in 1987, when a man named Siti Veni Rambuka staged a coup and overthrew the current government to establish a government that was Fijian dominant and um, in discriminatory against the Indian Fijians. But times changed. He eventually became prime minister at one point, but after that, in 1998, a new constitution was written that gave equality to all peoples living in Fiji, no matter where your people descend descended from. In 1999, a Fijian Indian was elected prime minister, pretty much letting the Indian political party being the dominant one. So there was another coup in 2000 to try to stop the Indian domination in a way. And eventually a bill was put out to vote that would pardon everyone involved in the 2000 coup, which upset a lot of people, obviously, including a man named Frank Baini Marama, who actually participated in the 2000 coup, but he was like, this is like, you know, an unjust bill, blah, 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 it should be taken off, there shouldn't be bills like this, which I agree, there shouldn't be bills like this, but he would have benefited from it, but anyway guess he was doing like the righteous thing, right? So he organized a coup in 2006. Um, they were suspended from the Commonwealth during this time until Baini Marama eventually allowed elections again in 2014 and they were readmitted. During that election, he was elected prime minister. He's been re-elected every year ever since. There's another election this year in 2022. Uh, I'm not sure if he's allowed to run. I didn't actually look it up, but... We'll have to see where that goes. And that's essentially where Fiji is today. The only other major issue in the more modern era, other than global warming and the issue of the oceans rising and swallowing up Fiji forever, is, speaking of water, Fiji water, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. That water is actually bottled in Fiji. It's a huge industry. And the concern is the environmental impact of bottling water and plastic and shipping it around the world. Like, it's like a very clean, refined kind of water, you know? But what's the point if it's creating this huge carbon footprint to get it out into the world? A little controversial, but... And, you know, I've had Fiji water a couple times. It's fine. It's good. It just tastes like filtered water to me. Let me zoom this out, and we'll flip through the book. All right, I think that's better. <laughs> better shot of the book. Oh, see, I think this is what, when people think of Fiji, this is when people think of the beautiful clear waters and beaches and things like that. Here's some sweet faces. Melanesian people can be born with a certain gene that gives them blonde hair. It's the only place in the world outside of Europe where people can be born with naturally blonde hair. Let's see, they're taking some tours out to an island here. And here is a very sweet leatherback turtle. Of course, you know, turtles are very protected. A beautiful waterfall, it's named Magic Waterfall. Gorgeous, there's the map that I already showed you. And uh, we have some disaster from 
Cyclone Winston. Uh, doesn't say what year that was. Oh, here it is, 2016. We've got some very ancient stone statues here. Here's a drawing of, like, pre-colonization Fiji, where, you know, this talks about the cannibalism issue. Anyway, here's the Fijian flag being raised for the first time in 1970. There we go, almost all together. There's Rambuka, Sitiveni Rambuka, as I mentioned before. Here he is again. It says this is during the 2000 coup. There was a hostage crisis. They stormed like the parliament and held people hostage. Pretty scary. The election in 2014, it says they they lost their election cards, just why so many of these people don't look too pleased. Nothing worse than misplacing like government papers. It takes forever to get it back. Voting because I'm Fiji. There's Prince Charles visiting in 1970. This is the current president. It's Joji Konrote, I believe. But it's the text down here, Prime Minister that has the power, it's that kind of government. We've got the Parliament House over here. And this is where the Parliament meets in this building here. And you can see a little statue to that's how it's spelled, but it's pronounced Takumbao. Fijian's an interesting language. Here's their coat of arms, and what I like about this is that you can see some of their traditional weapons that they made back before um, it was colonized. There's some sugar cane being harvested. This person here is chopping up some coconut. Yeah, luxurious little tourist cabins there. Pretty much when you think of Fiji, you think that. Some fishies for sale. Open air market. Here's the Fiji water. We've never seen it before. It's so it's like here in California, it's like five dollars fifty cents a bottle. Like it's outrageously expensive for water. There's this brand of water from Iceland, which goes on sale for like ninety nine cents. It tastes okay, but it's 99 cents. <laughs> like, that's so much better if you need to buy bottled water, you know? Anyway, <laughs> the car just interrupted me, so I'll stop the bottled water rant. Um, a transit center in Suva. Some very sweet little fruit bats. I think bats are cute. A gorgeous little waterfall. Very pretty. And we have a scuba diver looking at the coral. Helping out some turtles here. And a really beautiful iguana. The Fiji crested iguana. That is a lovely shade of green. Here's a Napoleon fish or a humphead wrasse. But if you've played Animal Crossing like me, you know that's a Napoleon fish. <laughs> Napoleon fish. The Garden of the Sleeping Giant used to be a private residence. Now it's a public park. So these people are drinking some kava, which is a very traditional drink used in ceremonies in Fiji. And I've heard that it's like, if you've never had it before, if you haven't like drunk it, like constantly as a Fijian, it's repulsive, which I was like, really? But a few weeks ago, I found a tea where the top note was kava. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I bought it, took it out of the box and just immediately hit with this smell that whoa. I, I didn't drink the tea I knew I couldn't handle it oh my gosh it was so strong and whoa. I can't even describe it I just was instantly like mm -mm, no 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 <laughs> look at this sweet having some fun he's saying bula which is their friendly hello a beautiful Hindi temple what else do we have? Oh, another little sweet here. Well, she's chopping up a coconut. 
Okay. The traditional houses that they've built on Fiji since forever. Here's the kava, the bowl there for the ceremony. And here we can see Prince Harry, his beautiful wife, visiting Fiji in 2018. It's down there. It's like I said, they are part of the Commonwealth again. Here's a little primary school. And here's Suva. Look at that. Remarkable. Very beautiful city. This guy is dressed in traditional clothes for like a tourist thing and there's another guy saying Bula. Really beautiful scene here. The little cross there. A little cross is probably very big. <laughs> a Catholic church here. Here's some fire walkers. And this is a Methodist church and a Hindu temple. Very beautiful. Not that these buildings aren't beautiful, but I like colorful buildings. Here is a chief and look, he has the wheel teeth in his hands. These are wheel teeth. Huge. <laughs> I didn't realize like when I picture wheel teeth, I think of like baleen. Oh, I guess yeah, sperm whales have the big choppers, right? huge. <laughs> I mean, obviously they're whales, but still. Another Hindu temple here. This guy's reading the newspaper. What else do we have? Oh, these kids get to hear some good Dr. Seuss stories. And this guy's reading the newspaper. The political drama happening there, apparently. And this is a picture from the 2006 coup. They're at the television station making sure everything's being broadcasted just so. Beautiful weaving here. Probably making like a basket or a mat or something. Let's see. Oh, they're making pottery. It's like another person with a coconut, but they're making pots. Awesome. And, oh, he's carving a turtle. Awesome. Here's a library. My favorite kind of building. The traditional dance here. Probably doing it for tourists as well. Speaking of <laughs> singing for tourists. It's on Malolo Island, so yeah, that's in that tourist area over here. Another picture of a traditional Fijian house. Lots of sweet faces here. And there's, oh, that's my favorite one right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very cute. Rugby is the big sport in Fiji. I know in some places it's like soccer slash football. Uh, here it's rugby. And here we can see the rugby team winning gold at the Rio Olympics. Fiji's first gold medal, I believe. A fire dance. This is their traditional, like, pit barbecue called Lovo, where they barbecue it in the earth, wrapped up in leaves. Diwali celebration. Ooh, these worms come out of the ground twice a year. I guess they taste like caviar, it says. They're a delicacy. He's got some gigantic eggplants here for sale. <laughs> Looks very proud. Grew him himself, maybe. Can't turn the page. Uh, hello, please. There we go. So we can see this pretty picture of another Lovell being set up to cook some meat. There we go. And some more eggplants for sale. Or aubergines, they're also called. I think they're only called eggplants here in America. Lots of tropical fruits for sale. Look like taro. Or taro. Taro. Right? Yeah. And lots of other goodies. We've got some food, spicy fish, yum yum, and spiced sweet potatoes and bananas. Sounds very good. Another map of Fiji over here, and a more zoomed out view of 
where Fiji is in the world. So that's going to be it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night.